to ask a question that, I, which I want to use to frame everything that I know is going to come from that, because I think it's a question that actually would be useful to ask, and that is, what do we understand the fundamental purpose of homeowners insurance to be? Because I think a discussion on that, from both the industry perspective, but also the, at least the consumers think it should be, would be a useful sort of way of starting any kind of discussion, because I think there's a very, not very clear understanding of what we think the purpose of homeowners insurance is to be, except for maybe to, ex to protect the mortgage lender's exposure. Uh, what do we understand to be the purpose of homeowners insurance? Well, so why don't we have each, mm -hmm. Jim, and I can take first and check. Well, I mean, I think uh, the, the fundamental reason people buy insurance is to protect, for most people, the biggest possession they will own in their life. And, you know, I think, obviously, I don't, I think that's, they think, if I have a fire, what happens? How do I rebuild this place? What happens to my, my clothing? What happens to my TV? How do I replace that? And the only way to do that, if, unless you're very wealthy and can self-insure, is using the insurance process, which is basically where a large homogeneous group of people get together and they share the risk. They pay into a pool the premiums and they, they, they rely on the laws of probability that, that most people do not have losses. So there's enough money in the pool, if you have a big enough pool, that you can draw that the people who do have losses can get paid. And that's how the system works. That's how the whole insurance system works. And I think that's the fundamental that some people lose track of. You know, you're protecting your most valuable possession next to your family, obviously. So what do you hear from your customers? I, I think Jim's hit the nail on the head. I would just add, not to repeat what Jim said, I just give a little history about homeowners insurance, okay? Um, how did it come about? Okay, it's actually Ben Franklin, uh, mm -hmm. and and started the first insurance company in Philadelphia. And the reason why he bought it back then is that the fire departments were not public. Okay, they were private, and so the private insurance com uh, department said, "Gosh, let's form an insurance company." Okay, um, and so if there's a fire, um, you know, we'll, we'll take care of the customer. But if if it's a fire that we don't insure, we're not going to put that fire out. So we'll get people to buy the, the, you know, the fire department's policy, so to speak, if they have the insurance company with the fire department. So it was kind of interesting. But it goes back to the mortgage um, uh, situation where, uh, as you know, if you have a mortgage, the, the uh, bank uh, or mortgage company is uh, not going to loan you the money unless you protect that asset. And because if they have to foreclose on that asset, um, or if you had a fire, they want to make sure they get paid their mortgage amount. So. Um, so that's what about the customers, your your customers, um, who don't have mortgages, or if they pay yeah. down their mortgages, why do they continue to buy well, homeowners insurance? Well, again, for Jim's reason, uh, that even though they don't have a mortgage, it's still a significant asset, if not the greatest asset, within their portfolio of assets, and they want to protect that. And it's not just fire; it, you know, it's hurricane. It's it's uh, uh, our our <coughs> mayor. And the, uh, prior to the existing one just got burglarized, as you probably all heard, and, and so it's theft insurance and all those type of things as well. Question. Yep, John. You mentioned that all of the admitted carriers are members of the FAIR plan. What specifically does that mean? Like how, how are their finances involved or arranged with the FAIR plan? How do they benefit or lose or pay in or whatever? Well, in, in theory, every company and on a yearly basis, we assess what their market share is. The insurance department tells us what their share is. And as I said to you, we function just like an insurance company. So we take in premium, and out of that premium, we pay our losses. If we were ever to get to a position where the losses exceeded our premium, the way we would continue to pay the losses is we would assess those member companies. And we would assess them based on their percentage of writing in the state. So if you're a company that writes 10% of the business in this state, property business in the state, I send you a bill for 10% of those losses that I can't pay. And that's how, in theory, it's supposed to work. 
theoretically, if I have a profit, I, they could be sent back to the companies in the corresponding percentage. Right now, we do not do that because we're building up a reserve that we're using as sort of our deductible in the event of a catastrophic loss. So what we do is we buy reinsurance. Right now, we're buying reinsurance at, at a level of almost a billion dollars. The first 200 million of that is our deductible. That's where our reserve is going. In lieu of sending it back to the member companies who will really own that, we're holding it in place. And then we buy the reinsurance above that level. So the, 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 the member companies will not start getting assessed until our losses exceed a billion dollars. But we've had to pay $89 million to get that extra coverage. And that's all factored into our rate. If, if a new company gets admitted in Massachusetts, do they pay in any capital, or is it only in the event of a? It, it's not pre-funded. No, the no, yeah, there's no membership fee. Not, not okay. pre-funded. Yeah, Kevin. Uh, oh, by the way, this is the deputy commissioner, Kevin Deegan. From the also division of insurance, and, and I appreciate being here today. <laughs> so I appreciate that. The division, but I also appreciate both the speakers. I think they did a fair job, and I'd even agree with Chuck's comment that we do an adequate job in the market. I think we find that being a regulator is a balancing act, consistently trying to find that middle ground between what can work and what you want to work. And especially in this market where we're dominated by regional or Massachusetts specific companies, we find a big issue for us consistently is that the more coverage they take on, the greater their risk, and in the event of a catastrophe, they could go into uh, problem areas. We recognize in other states, uh, we have national carriers that dominate uh, the home insurance market, most notably State Farm, Wall State, and, and it is something that we think that will help our market if we're able to bring more of those companies in. Uh, my question really is about how to encourage more companies to actually participate in the market, and even for you, Chuck, to tell a little more about why it's good to have more companies in the market. Right now, it's listed that there are 70. How does it help a consumer? How does it help an agent? How does it actually help for there being more coverage uh, available in the market when there are more companies? How does it help you? Good. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, it's it's uh, in in on the. Noni's regime as the insurance commissioner, we had very few auto insurance companies in Massachusetts, as you know, and uh, with deregulation of the auto business, the rates and so forth, we, we got, I've forgotten how many now, you probably know, a lot more insurance companies in the marketplace. We're up to 30 now. Up to 30. 19. We started with 19. So as a, as a result of deregulation, and prior to deregulation, the rates were set by the insurance department, and uh, and so the competition was not in play, and it is now, and competition is healthy. And, and I think those companies that feel they can get a return on their assets, a return on their investments, um, uh, want to play in the game. Okay, so how do we get more companies to play in the game? They need to get a return on their investment, all right? Um, and particularly the stock companies, and most of the, although State Farm is a mutual company, but a lot of your larger stock companies um, you know, are, are, have stockholders, and they and they need to get a return on their investment for the stockholders. So, um, when a company doesn't feel they can make money because of the cost of reinsurance and the exposure on that deductible of the reinsurance, they're not going to want to play. Um, and uh, so, how do we get more companies in? And I, I do feel it's healthy. I think uh, uh, when Noni deregulated automobile insurance, there was a lot of agents uh, that feared that and and uh, criticized that. Um, we actually, as an agency, have embraced it, and, and we've grown in the marketplace because of deregulation of auto insurance. Um, and so what, what that was all about, insurance companies were able to set their own rates. Now, to, to transition, and Noni certainly talked about this better than I can, but to transition that whole thing, there were caps and so forth, uh, so, that, so the market wouldn't get out of whack. But um, uh, it's been a healthy situation. And, and so how do we deregulate the homeowner's market, okay? Um, it's really, when you have a, a player like the FAIR plan, and again, thank God for the FAIR plan, um, writing as much business as they do, okay, we gotta deregulate them, if you will. We, we're, we're subsidizing the market play, or we're, we're, we have rates out there in the FAIR plan that um, 
based upon the market and what other companies are charging is a lot less. And, and you're just not gonna get players coming in to the market with that depressed rate. Now, uh, I guess it's a debate whether what is right, what's the right rate. You have a consumer issue, a political issue in that regard as well of increasing rates to, to it all. I mean, I, I'd love to see that the fair plan um, still has to play a role, but boy, I'd like to see them somewhere at the midpoint or at least the average of the, of the marketplace as far as rates are concerned. Uh, right now, they're way below average. And uh, so that's step number one, I would say. Uh, the other area to, to do it, I, you know, is the ENS market grows, um, and it is growing uh, quite, I would say, rapidly, but at a pretty good pace. Um, that's going to create a problem for the admitted carriers um, because the, the ENS market doesn't have that obligation of the guarantee fund or the uh, potential assessment of the fair plan if we get hit by a major storm. So as the ENS market takes more and more business away and runs home with it, they don't have that obligation. The obligation gets bigger with, with less revenue uh, for the for the admitted markets. How did they, and in respect to that, how did their rates compare to the fair plan and the, the admitted market, the they're ENS? Like, they're, they're, in most cases, and you can't really make a generalization, right. but most cases they're uh, less than the fair plan and much less than the voluntary admitted market. Yeah. Are there elements of their policies that are even different than the standard policies in the market so that there <coughs> could be more flexibility in what products are being sold? Um, I would say, I, I mean, we don't write a lot, as I mentioned, in the sure. ENS market, so I, I, I can't really do a, a good comparison of their products to the rest of the market, but um, in most cases, the, the coverages are less. It's not as strong as the HO3, which is the standard, okay? The other thing, and we didn't get into it, and I don't know if it's necessary, but you know, there, there are wind deductibles, um, there are uh, hurricane deductibles, and there are named storm deductibles. And so every company will have a different definition of when the deductible applies. And the deductible for wind or hurricane or whatever it is, is, is generally a percentage of the coverage on the house. So if you have a $300,000 home, you could have a 2% deductible, which would be a $6,000 deductible, or you could have a 5% deductible, which is $15,000. And, uh, and so, again, the, the ENS market <coughs> is, is not required to do any filings in that regard where the, where the admitted markets are as far as the deductibles, <coughs> and get approval on those deductibles, <coughs> and so forth. So there could be variation as far as deductible as well as coverage. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, would a simple-minded solution that would help the ENS, if, if I were going to buy ENS and had to sign a one-page waiver that yes. listed off the weaknesses that yes. you just talked about, yes. would, I mean, does anything like that happen, or okay. do people think they're buying something as good as the admitted market and sort of fool themselves? I don't know. <coughs> yeah. I, I don't know whether that sort of thing is helpful. There, there is a form, okay, it, that is um, in play now where you as a consumer need to sign, oh, okay? okay? Uh, is that being done on a regular basis? No, okay. The form is rather outdated. Um, in fact, I have sent to the insurance department Connecticut's form and also Florida's process and form for ENS. Um, Florida is very tough uh, to go to the ENS market as far as disclosure is concerned and letting the consumer know, um, you know what the shortfalls are being in the ES market. As I say, oftentimes, uh, I, I have a client that uh, has a beautiful home in Falmouth, okay, right on the water, low elevation. I, could, I had no company to write him. I had to go to the ENS firm, and he understood that. And that's where the ENS has a play in the marketplace, okay? Um, but uh, uh, it's, as I say, it's not being used that way. It's being used as a primary market. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm Ken Deitch. I'm an economist by, by training. I've got a particular interest in the uh, Vision's role as a, as a regulator, not specifically in, in the area of homeowners, but more specifically in the area of long-term care insurance. Well, wait, Ken, I know you have an issue with the department. No, on but that. I There's just wanted to on that. But let's. This is really on the home. I understand. I, I wanted area. to ask a question of, about uh, what uh, one of Charles's uh, slides in the uh, really the, I think the the first slide, which said rather specifically that the main mission. Uh, of the uh, of, of the division is the solvency of companies, and and my question was simply this: is is that language is that legislative language or is that regulatory language? Is, is that the uh, the division's 
uh, uh, concept of itself, or is that written? And it's prob probably either Nani or Kevin would, would, you know, know perhaps better than I, Charles I, or Jim. I believe it's in the legislation. I believe the legislation is close to that language, but I believe we developed the mission statement probably about three or four years ago. Um, not four years ago, probably about ten years ago. That's that's now on the division website. But it is it is the the obligation of the division to have uh, companies that ultimately are going to be able to meet their promises to the consumers, which is to pay the claim. But let's let's keep this on the home and church market. Did, um, Amy, I have three actually three short questions. Um, um, and I'm sorry if I missed this at the beginning, but is the is the fair plan? Is it correct that it's a state subsidized plan? Is that what, is that why the rates are lower? No, no, no. no. It's, it's a it's a it is it, it was formed by legislation, but it is a private nonprofit uh, insurance company. Okay, and they can have lower rates because of the way the legislation is structured. Well, they, they have lower, we would have lower rates because that's what our experience says the rate has to be. It's a mathematical formula that, you know, I, I long ago okay. gave up on trying no, to figure out. That's, <laughs> that's for that's Caleb to do the actuaries and things like that. But well, one, one of the costs they don't have that Jim mentioned at the beginning is they don't have any marketing costs. Yes, and I heard you say that that's like a big difference between us. And, and then um, the... People that the the MPUIA I think MPIA said race, yeah. right said you don't um, is for is for people that can't get insurance through the normal market is the main reason I'm curious what the main reason is that income based or is it people on the Cape that have those those difficult to insure homes is it more of that that's ba it's the basically it's an availability issue I mean okay. people in the beginning uh, when we were formed back in '68. A lot of the fair plans started. It was because the, the companies, normal market companies, were afraid to run in the cities because they were afraid of the riots, the losses in attendance because okay. of the riots. And this, so it's sort of a similar parallel now. On the Cape, companies are afraid of a potential hurricane. Okay. So they fall, pull back. And so when it, they pull back, they're not going to write. So obviously, we step into the breach and, and write, you know, okay. offer our writings. I guess uh, uh, maybe we could illuminate this a little bit more, though, about what the Massachusetts structure is different from other states. Um, in Rhode Island, for example, mm -hmm. it has a huge exposure. The, their fair plan is not as big a player. No. Why is that? Okay, B the biggest reason is in, in a lot of states, the way the legislation is written, <coughs> they are very specific on the rate side. And they basically set the rate to not have what Chuck is alluding to. They make the fair plan rate almost the highest in the state. In Rhode Island, it's by design. You can still buy the insurance, so it's not you know you're not it's not going to be closed out. But it isn't the first choice, so it makes the placer of the insurance have to work to find that in, or the or the insured work harder to find a normal company to write again. And that happens in Rhode Island. We only write for 5% of the business in Rhode Island. For that reason, the legislation is pegged that we have to be in the upper ten, you know, upper 90th percentile of all the rates written in the state. So we take an average of all the top 10 writers and we, we're pegged at the top end. And because of that, it sort of deters people from using the fair plan as the first choice. Yes, we have a question here. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, well, Mr. Robinson had mentioned that, um, like, if the fair plan is moving to Lexington, for example, um, they could charge 20% rates that were 20% less than uh, other insurance companies' rates. Um, and I guess my question is, uh, what's really so bad about that? Isn't ultimately what we want to do is cover everyone and make sure they're covered and make sure everyone's solvent at the lowest possible rates? And I understand that if everyone's covered by the fair plan, then we couldn't access the companies if anything happened to it, because there would be no other companies. But at the same time, um, uh, if everyone's covered by one company, uh, then what are the chances that company is going to go and become itself? 
I think that's for you first, and then probably Jim. Great question. Great question. It's a good one. It is very good. Um, let me let me see if I can answer it. Okay. Um, the fair plan writes around forty percent of the market of Cape Cod, so we almost have one player for all the, you know for that amount of market share. Okay. Um, and and I don't know the numbers on this, but um, I think Jim mentioned that they have a $200, $200 million deductible under their reinsurance. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how much surplus right now the Fiat plan has, but I'm not sure it's $200 million. It's, it's getting close, if not there. Yeah, it's pretty much our reserve. Okay. Have you, in the Fiat plan, modeled, now again, you can question the modeling, okay, but um, what your uh, exposure is if we get hit by a Category 3 or a Category 4? Do you have enough reinsurance is the question based upon the models that are out there? No. You uh, don't have enough uh, reinsurance. Okay. And it, it all depends on, again, we have 350 members of our association. And you know, some want us to buy reinsurance that covers everything, no matter the cost. And some want us to buy less reinsurance. So we're, we're sort of playing the game of buying right where the majority wants us want us to buy it, which is the most affordable. So, okay. But, so but it, I'm going to get back to his question. I'm going to get to his question. question. Based upon that, okay, that they have enough surplus for that deductible of 200 million, but they don't have enough reinsurance, okay, protect against that catastrophic loss. All right. So, then the question would be to answer your question: Is the rate responsible? Okay. Is it? Is it? Um, Adequate is you know so you can charge less, but is it adequate to cover for that catastrophic loss? And that's the issue. All right. So you could say, and what Jim just said, that the <coughs> rates for the fair plan aren't adequate enough because they, if they had more money to buy more reinsurance to protect themselves, and because the other players are in play to pick up the tab if that catastrophic thing should happen. So go back to a Lexington or ENS market player. You know, it's responsibility. You know, it's not so much how cheap it is, it's, it is what is the adequate rate to cover the deductible and to cover the catastrophic event that's not covered by reinsurance. <laughs> so you can get a company that can apply to the insurance department tomorrow and say, I want to do business on Cape Cod and I'm going to charge 50% less than the fair plan. Great for the consumer, but is that responsible? Well, it's great for the consumer until there is a catastrophe. <laughs> right. And right. in addition, there is an additional sort of quirk in the fair plan, which is that their member companies are the backup, but they also buy reinsurance for that responsibility, for that loss. So they buy reinsurance for their own primary coverage. I'm right about that, right? For their own, wh whoever they uh, cover on the in the primary market, but they also buy reinsurance in case the fair plan hasn't bought um, enough reinsurance. So that really, um, to just emphasize Chuck's question, uh, response is maybe that rate isn't adequate. If they were a stock company, for example, their stockholders would be looking at this and saying, huh, is this company going to go out of business if we get hit with a big storm? Walter. Yeah, I want to take another, uh, uh, another way to look at the questions from both, from both of you in that corner, and that is, if you look at Rhode Island and you look at here, or you look at the prices in the fair plan, you look at the prices in the voluntary market, the, the statute in Massachusetts says, this is on one of your slides, says that the rates are required to be not excessive, inadequate, or unfairly discriminatory. So how do we determine that? In, in the case of the fair plan, we have a hearing, and everybody comes in, and so it's an actual rate, we have expert witnesses and so on, and they say, and we say that's the right rate. In Rhode Island, they look at it, they say, well, the, the rate that's not excessive, not inadequate, not unfairly discriminatory is going to be determined by the market. So then they say, well, we'll set the, the fair plan rate or the, the, the insured last resort rate at some rate, which is at a high level, that, assuming that whatever the market is determined. But, the, but the, the way we determine what the right rate here is, it, is, is based on uh, the theory that the market might be imperfect in determining that rate. So um, you know, if, if the rate, if, you know, to address the problem that you say we have, you have to, you would have to uh, have a different theory about what, what the right rate is and how to determine what exactly the right rate is. You wouldn't do it based on 
adversarial proceedings and actuarial experts and uh, you know people just uh, making um, uh, it's an entirely different way of determining. I mean, it's not entirely different because the companies have actuaries and the and the and the parties have actuaries, but it's a little bit different. Instead of people saying we think this is a fair amount of return on equity and this is a fair amount for losses and this is a fair, amount. you have a bunch of uh, of companies just say well, how much money would we like to make and that, and and, let, and assume that there's a competitive market and that produces entirely it's it, as you can see it produces a different rate and when you have when you t entirely deregulate like you do in the ENS market you have an even lower rate. Um, but I, was, I wanted to ask you, you say that the division is being uh, remiss in some area. And was it this business about the not affidavits not being? Uh, it's, uh, ask the end of your question. So oh, well, I'm sorry, but I, I apologize. Uh, the, uh, you had indicated that the division is being remiss in, because in, in uh, its regulation, but what little regulatory authority we have over the surplus lines writers, and because the, the, the statute requires that you can't buy, you can't purchase surplus lines uh, coverage unless you can't get, it, 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 there's no writers in the, in the admitted market, and so it shouldn't really be an issue except in the over a million dollar, you know, things like that, but you're suggesting that, th that there's a kind of a market in that where there is. Yes. Mm -hmm. in, in fairness, I mean, the excess carrier is, is the one that can really police that, obviously they're looking for the business, right? So they're not going to—they're not really insisting on seeing an affidavit <coughs> that says you—you know—you've been turned down by three. I think most of them just ignore that—that that requirement. And, you know. Yeah. The the affidavit, unfortunately, just really talks about it, it's been offered. Uh, I'm I as a consumer, I'm signing a form saying that I know that my home insurance has been offered to three other carriers and they've turned it down, and I'm signing that I know that. Okay. What it doesn't do, which this gentleman over here said, is because I'm in the ENS market, what, what are the pitfalls of being there? And, and what are the risks that I'm assuming by being there? Okay? And that needs to be improved. Well, any question? Chris, now let me ask a, a, again, a an academic type of question. In some respects, we focus a lot in insurance on what happens after the fact of a, of a, of a catastrophe or a major storm. And yet, and Jim, you had one slide about possible solutions to homeowner availability, and, and it really struck me that, obviously, we had ex what in Hurricane Andrew in Florida, of course, there was a real tension to Florida building codes, et cetera. And so the question is, in terms of this relation between requiring insurance for if in case bad things happen, versus government requiring homeowners and home builders to do certain things to make their homes more resistant to bad things from happening, or perhaps regulating where you could build homes, um, because you know, every time there's a storm situate seems to be on the headlines. Um, what is the fine balancing act? I mean, do we in fact use the role of government to preclude the need for it, to, for more insurance on the back end in case the, the dreaded you know, major you know, to lessen the impact, or do we sort of focus our efforts you know, on okay, making sure we have adequate coverage in case the bad thing does happen? I'd like to see if you can address that. I mean, that's really the, the, the balancing act here. And why doesn't it happen more on the front end as opposed to the back end? Or does it? it, it I think yeah. it's starting to happen yeah. more so. But again, we're, we're dealing with how do you put into say building code mm -hmm. requirements? I mean, you certainly get at the new piece of business, the new construction. And most construction in the Northeast is being built according to that standard. It's the pro the problem becomes retrofitting mm -hmm. an older home, so it would withstand the kinds of uh, rigors of, of a storm, and, and that's very expensive. I mean, you know, just the basic one of, for instance, making sure that your roof is tied to your wall, which is tied to, to, to the, the foundation, that, that, that would turn most people off. I mean, they, they could not afford the retrofit for that. Well, you know, and I would, I don't, it's not just an insurance problem. It's a, it really is a much more, it's a much broader governmental problem of how do you um, get people to be responsible for that. And the construction industry doesn't want it because it's hard, it's more expensive for mm -hmm. houses. The consumers don't want it because they have to pay for their retrofit. The people who want to build on the coast, you know, if they want to see the sunset or the sunrise mm -hmm. here, on the, uh, they want to be there. 
They don't want their government telling them they can't do that. Can we have one more question, Monica? I think you have one. Oh, I just had a specific question regarding the green market or the, the ENS market. And you said the, they have about 8,000 policies that have gone over, and you said the majority of them. The Fair Plan has written 8,000 less policies this year than a year ago. And so he doesn't he know where they've gone, but he's suggesting it. I'm suggesting that 8,000 might have gone. Of the 11,000 that the ENS, uh, that, that have gone to the ENS market. And you think, is, 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 is it, you guys believe that the majority of it is just because <coughs> not enforcing the, um, the, the disclosure, or is it because price, it's more than a thousand dollars, or is, is that the main reason, or are there any other reasons? It's, that it's the going? pricing is is uh, <coughs> probably a key factor. Mm -hmm. Okay, another factor is that um, it, the disclosure is not being made. Okay, and so consumer doesn't know they're seeing the price and saying, "Gosh, I can save a couple hundred dollars by going to Lexington." Put me with Lexington, not knowing. And majority, you think the majority of agents aren't properly disclosing that? That's correct. Yeah, that's my From opinion. our point of view, we really don't track where we lose business, I mean, you know, we make a certain assumptions. We know, for instance, that Narragansett, one of the newer companies on Cape, has been a little more aggressive. So we assume that it's going to our member company mm -hmm. somewhere along the line. But Chuck has a better handle on the Cape because that's his area of business. And, you know, he's telling us, because he also serves on our uh, advisory board, that, that a lot of, he knows a lot of that business <coughs> is going to the excess side of the equation. So I think we probably ought to stop now. Uh, thank our speakers very much. And, um, and th unless they're speaking for the door, they might wait for a question or two uh, if somebody has a question. And thank you all very much for coming. Uh, come next month, which is April 26th, April 26th to talk about civics education or education for jobs. So thank you. Thank you.